Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Villardi. I'm the Director of Pacific Programs at the American Museum of Natural History Center for Biodiversity and Conservation. And I'm here on the Explore 21 Solomon Islands Expedition, and I'm aboard the MV Aleutia, this sort of technological marvel of a research vessel that's allowing us to do, uh, well, to do things that no one's ever done before uh, in, the, in the Solomon Islands, one of the most remote oceanic archipelagos in the world. So what I'm going to do today is to give you a sense of this expedition by touring you around this incredible ship and introducing you to some of the researchers who are getting the, getting the job done. Um, the purpose of this expedition is really, well, it's really actually pretty simple. It's, uh, it's using this new technology to probe unexplored worlds, either worlds that are unexplored because we haven't been able to see them before, because we haven't had the lens to visualize them, or unexplored world unexplored worlds that we haven't been able to get to because they're so hard to reach, like the deepest bits of the ocean. And the way we do that, and I'm going to flip myself off here because the ship's way more interesting than me. The way we do that is using technology that is nothing less than spectacular. So I'm walking you out on the aft deck here, and there's heaps of camera equipment in here to document everything we're seeing both for our science, but also for the public. So there are going to be uh, some incredible media products that come out of this that will enable people to, to actually experience these unseen worlds on their own. But what I'm approaching now is one of the most magical aspects of this ship, and that is these deep water submarines that are the MV Aleutia's beating heart of scientific exploration. Here is the Nader. This is our main exploratory submarine here. This is one of the thrusters. Um, it's a Triton submarine. Here's a, a side thruster here. And uh, if I come out front here, um, I can sort of show you some of the incredible technology that makes the work here possible. So on this side of the sub here, you can see these, these crazy lights here. And what these lights do is at night, when there's no light at depth in the ocean, these lights shine pure blue light, which mimics daylight in the ocean, which is the, large, the world's largest blue light filter. So the only light that gets down there is blue light. And these two cameras, one of them sees full spectrum daylight, but the other one, this one here, only sees all light except for blue. It filters out all blue light. So when you shine these blue lights here on an organism at night and you bounce back the light and this thing can't see that blue light, all you see is the transformation of blue light by the organism and the patterns that we've been discovering and that AMH scientists have been discovering are really remarkable. It's patterns that suggest there are heaps of new species in the ocean that we haven't been able to see or discover because of these invisible patterns that required this technology and these subs to uncover. So this ball right here is the largest acrylic ball ever made on Earth. It's about six inches thick of pure acrylic that just disappears when you go in the ocean. And I'm just going to walk you up these stairs here because it's just awesome to see where you get in. Um, this is like getting into the lunar module, you know, to get down into the depths. This thing can go up to 1,000 meters below the surface of the ocean, almost 10,000 feet down into these crushing pressures. And you're not just looking through a porthole. You're like living in that little crystal bubble like the Good Witch floating around down there. It's fairly phenomenal. Here is the hatch. It's right up on top. You've got to squig squiggle yourself down here. And... One of our colleagues here, I don't know if you can see, is down in the... Why don't you introduce yourself and tell me what you're doing down there. Hi, Calvin McGee, one of the sub-pilots out here. And uh, we just kept the sub pre dive ready to uh, ready to go today. Checking all the systems, making sure they're all functioning correctly. Awesome. And, and how do you drive the sub? Well, it's just a little joystick, like a video game. Push it forward, the sub goes forward, turn it, it turns left, right. So it's all done within a second. Awesome. Thank you, Kelvin. So you see that? Video games aren't all bad. As long as you have purpose in life, all those video game skills could actually end up 
serving humanity really well. Okay, so here I'm going to go down the stairs, and what I'm going to take you to is not only does the Elusha have this incredible technology in terms of these vehicles, what it also has is amazing computer and remote sensing technology to enable the ship to provide scientists and the sub-operators a sense of exactly where the vehicles are in space, a sense of the bathymetry or the, the structure of the bottom of the ocean. And here we are in mission control where essentially you can track all the movements of the sub, um, what the area around us looks like, where we are. You can actually see what the bottom structure looks like, the depth. Obviously for safety, there are a huge redundancy of safety measures where you can kind of, you know where everybody is at any given time. And then undersea life seen by the sub can often be visualized right here in mission control. These are spotted dolphins. Um, just panning around here and here the the ship has an entire IT center that's run by an IT officer mark here so there's internet this streaming uh, this streaming portal that we're working through now is provided by him on the ship we're in one of the most remote regions on earth and uh, and we're able to stream live to you um, from here which to be honest I've been working here with the museum for over 10 years I've been coming here myself for almost 20 and have never had the potential for anything like this. Here's some more of the camera equipment, again, that is used to visualize that which we have never been able to see before by using specialized light and filtering technology to see both bioluminescent organisms, these are organisms that create their own light, and to see fluorescent organisms, organisms that are reflecting light that we've never been able to see before. Okay, we were going to take you up top, but I'll probably get blown off into the sea if I go all the way up there. It's blowing pretty hard. This is just a squall coming through. I don't know if you can see it here, but off our port side here is one of the most remote islands in the Solomons, arguably one of the most remote islands in the world, Mborokua. It has a long history of being a way station for headhunters here, and now is a haven for organisms that have vanished from nearly other, every other part of the world. And a lot of the reason why this island is here and intact is because of support that the AMNH has been able to give through its Center for Biodiversity and Conservation to the customary landholders who have sovereign rights and title to this land based on 10,000 years of oral history, of stories, of symbols that tracks their ownership and, um, and sovereignty over these places. These are some of the richest reefs on Earth and that's really why Alusha is here, is not only are these places intact, meaning they've got the richness and diversity that has been here for thousands of years. So it's almost like a time capsule. You can look at what the world used to look like and compare this to other places that have had more impact. And then the other thing is these islands, like this tiny volcano out in the middle of the sea, fall away from a few meters along the shore where we are here, where the boat is right here, how deep is it under us, Captain? Uh, 105 meters. So 105 meters, 300, 300 feet right here. It just falls right away into that black abyss that enables our scientist in Su Kim, John Sparks, to probe bioluminescent organisms and fluorescent organisms that live in those dark, deep corners of the ocean that really, until now, have been very poorly explored. Here we are, and this is an active lab. It's sort of a combination of three labs back in New York that's now here, all sort of concatenated or combined on the ship. And this is Insu Kim, um, microbiologist from the American Museum. And Insu, what are you doing here? I'm looking at one of the lagoon samples that we collected a couple of days ago. And what are you finding? There's many different kinds of proteins and microorganisms. Yeah, one of the real things that Insu and I were sort of thinking about is that in these lagoon systems where you have many zones of, uh, of substrate on the bottom and temperatures across the water, you're, you're, she's finding some of the most diverse samples, which makes a lot of sense, but no one's ever done that before. And part of it is because no one's been able to do the kind of detailed work that she's able to do on the Aleutia 
right next to these places. And that's one of the things. Her samples need to be, they're very fragile. They need to be taken care of because they need to be alive so she can isolate individuals and grow them into cultures that enable her to see to see what she has when her organisms are, you know, some tiny fraction of the diameter of a hair, a human hair. So here's something really cool. Um, this is a microscope that Dave Gruber and, and Vincent have put together. Um, here's Dave right here. And, uh, and what he's doing is visualizing an organism um, that they've been trying to test to see if it fluoresces. And not only see if it fluoresces, can see if it can see fluorescence. So we're doing some detailed analysis on the eyes um, to look at the color of light that's making it through the eye to see if they're able to filter out the blue light and be able to see the, the fluorescent light. So um, by able having to fresh samples on the ship, we could take this and we then have a onboard spectrophotometer that measures the, the spectra of light coming off here. So oh, now yeah, we look can, at that. I don't know so if you can see that, light, everybody. White so light. This is happening right now, you guys. Versus something like blue light. Where so that's be a very blue light. Spectra. So we'll look at the, the, the light that's coming through the eyes and be able to see if these fish could see the world of, um, of fluorescence that we're, we're now discovering. That's awesome. Great. Thanks, Dave. And here we go. Back into the heart of it all. Hey, you guys. Morning. This Morning. is Don, Bob, and John Sparks, our fearless leader here. Um, and uh, what are you guys up to in here? Holy mackinoli, that is so cool. Okay. <laughs> We are no, nothing like waking up in the morning to eel. So we're scanning through fish that have come off the reef in this bin, and we're flashing blue light over them and looking through yellow glasses to filter out the blue. So we're just doing a triage right now looking for fluorescent specimens. So in this bin, we have some fluorescent crop fields, and it's like mainly eels, fluorescent here. And then once we pick out the really bright fluorescent fishes, we take a photo out of the other tank. Awesome. So, John, can you explain what you're doing here? I'm just going to come behind you. Yeah, so we're taking pictures of these fish under white light, so red light would usually look like under daylight, and then fluorescent conditions. So we put special filters or our flashes that make the light very, very blue and narrow the bandwidth down to get every kind of blue light. And then we take put it over our camera lens as well to block out any reflected blue light. So we just want to capture the full presence and put it in the box. I can show you if you want. That'd be, that'd be great. I think we'll be able to see this, folks. Right, let's see if we can see it. So that's fine. The light's not like that. Let's like that. And, we'll see if, and that's a glowing eel, if you can oh, get that. Oh, wow. So here, John, can you ex – so what are we looking at here? Go closer to the yeah. phone so folks can hear So you. this is an eel just under white light. It's a very little, it's called a false moray or a clopsid eel. Under daylight conditions, they blend into the reef. You'll never, ever, ever see these guys. They're actually poorly represented in They're extremely difficult to collect. We're able to use techniques we can get a, a bunch of them and collect them. And then we, when we image them, as you can see, under white light, as many fluorescent fishes are, they're very, very kind of cryptic. They blend in with the reef really well. You would not never notice them if you were scuba diving over the reef. Under fluorescent conditions, as we just showed you, they're extremely bright. And they're brilliant. So you can imagine you're in a reef environment where you get this filtered blue light. The light's already there, the, the blue light, and you excite this fluorescence. These things are probably using it to communicate with each other and find each other. Um, and what we find with a lot of fluorescent fish is uh, the patterns are spe species specific, meaning each species has its own unique fluorescent pattern. So it's a way they're probably communicating and recognizing each other in these otherwise uh, very fish that blend in really well. The other interesting thing is Dave Gruber said a few minutes ago, a lot of these fish have yellow filters in their eyes. So they've already got this emission filter essentially that we use to capture fluorescence built into their eye. So if you consider it, you got three things going on. you got this very blue filtered environment. The light is kind of identical to what we produce in our flashes to excite fluorescence. You have these cryptic fish that kind of hide otherwise, but they have these fluorescent proteins um, 
in their epidermis or other parts of the body that gets excited by the blue light and then gives off um, light of lesser energy, the greens, reds, and oranges, and they've already got this filter built into their eyes so they can see it. So they're kind of seeing what we're seeing through the camera, but underwater. Awesome. Thanks, John. You're welcome. And so I have a question for you. Um, that is, what, what's, the, what's the coolest thing you found thus far in terms of your science and your your thinking? What's the, what's the coolest thing you found thus far? What about a, a lot of it? Um, what we find that's interesting on this trip is at least we've been going deeper, collecting deeper water fish um, via scuba, going down to kind of the top of the Mesa point. That's kind of where the light starts to peter out under me. So you're getting down 30, 40 meters and plus, getting kind of this filtered ambient light starts to get darker. And it's a region that hasn't sampled very well. And we're finding that the fluorescence is still very prevalent down there, these little fish that, and again, these little cryptic gobies and blennies that you never really see. You bring them up and put them under fluorescent light, and they're extremely brilliant. So it's, it's, it's uh, kind of fascinating for us to find the fluorescence is kind of all the way, at least down further than we thought in the water column. And it's still very prevalent down there. Yeah, no, I mean, that's one of the things that's really struck me, too, is that in environments that I'm really familiar with now, with you guys here, this technology here, you're sort of seeing them anew. There's a whole new set of patterns. It's like seeing new animals that were always there under your under your nose. Yeah, so. I mean, you think about it. You swim over a reef with your snorkel over a reef. You see these beautiful butterfly fish and angel fish. You know, those are the things that capture your attention. And there's this whole other world out there that we never see. I mean, we, we can collect the fish using Techniques would get the little fish to come out and these cryptic fish, and you know otherwise we we'd never know that this was going on. This whole kind of light show, these these kind of wavelengths, these these orbs we're using down there, um, if we didn't do studies like this, and we kind of it's all kind of a serendipitous find. You know, initially we found a green eel, a Caribbean, and it kind of got us started scanning a lot of other fish, and we found it's extremely prevalent across not only bony fishes but cartilaginous and sharks and rays as well. Awesome. Well, th thanks so much, you guys. I know you, you guys have been working really hard just cause, uh, because you're working at night. The schedule has you up all night. So uh, it's awesome to see you guys here in the lab in the morning. And uh, I'm going to walk these guys out of here. See you, Bob. Bye. Bye, Don. Bye. Bye. So... That's a little bit of what's going on here. Um, we're about to start the day, so uh, I probably should sign off now. Um, you know, I know some people sent in some questions, and, and one of the questions that people asked is sort of what, how many people are on the boat? And uh, there are a few people working here over in the in the corners. You can see that's, that's Steve Hudson, who's sort of the, the commander-in-chief of operations. He's also the dive safety officer, a really gifted diver. Cook, you can imagine, but there are 40 people on this vessel. All of them eat in here and live on the ship. Ten of those are our AM and H scientists, but even our scientists have got to uh, participate in the operations of the ship because uh, it, um, well, it takes a lot to run a, run a ship like this. So I think that's about all. I wish I could hear you guys talking, um, but, you know, I, I, uh, I, bet I'll, I bet I'll hear from some of you through our website. But in any event, again, I'm Chris Lardy, and uh, I'm here with the American Museum's Explore 21 Solomon Islands Expedition, and uh, I'll be signing off now and wish you guys a great day and, and hope you see some of the media that comes out of this because um, it's been a spectacular trip, and, um, and we're only just beginning to know what we found. That'll come as we return to the museum, and over the next months, there'll be all sorts of discovery happening there at the American Museum, and, well, we hope to see you there as well. Bye-bye.